Hey Trivers, I'm T. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Anhee, and welcome to our online worship experience. If you're new, there are a couple things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're new. Uh -huh. If you're new, there are a couple of tools to help you get connected and follow along with our teaching. The Connect tab will allow you to share a little about yourself and someone from our church can contact you this week. There's also a tab to take sermon notes, follow along in scripture, and a private prayer chat to connect you with someone from our prayer team. Guys, Christmas Eve is next <laughs> week. <laughs> our service times for Thursday are 1.30, 3, 4.30, and 6 for both our online and Harrison Lane, and 3 and 4.30 at their own county and Bearden campuses. As you make a reservation for on-campus worship, keep in mind that we will have live teaching and the same music in each venue. Beginning January 1st, we begin a 21 day of prayer journey together as a church family. We'll be using the book 21 Days of Breakthrough Prayer as a resource. You can pick up your copy at Get Connected on the weekend or at your campus office during the week. Just a reminder to register for our virtual quiet waters that will be held in January. We are having family worship services on December 27th and January 3rd and we will have the nursery available for birth to two years old on all three campuses. 11 a.m. services on Harrison Lane and Roan County campuses and 10 a.m. on Bearden. Reservations are required. And be sure to visit the events page at trc.tv slash events to get more info on what's going on and for all of our service times or to join us for online worship experience. You can also stay connected through Facebook or Instagram at Two Rivers TN. Thanks for joining us for online worship. <laughs>《Hey, Two Rivers, I'm Jason, and we want to thank you for your continued partnership in ministry. This past year has been a challenge for all of us, and yet, in the midst of all the struggle that has been 2020, we find ourselves both tired and grateful. Last year, we told you we were going to be rolling out a 10-year vision that we were really excited about, but instead, we pivoted in March to keeping a church connected through a global pandemic. We started gathering again on our campuses over the summer, and even moved our Bearden campus from a school to a rented facility to relaunch in August, all while the majority of our church family continues to worship online. We continue to wait on the right time to roll out the vision in its entirety, but we feel like God has given a direction for the start of the coming year. Get ready. As we head into 2021, we wanna invite you to go on a 21-day prayer journey. In January, we'll be talking about life-giving spiritual rhythms that will allow us to be renewed, strengthened, and ready for the opportunity that lies ahead. What opportunity? The opportunity we see God opening to make a gospel-centered difference right here in East Tennessee. And we believe God's calling us to be spiritually ready for what lies ahead. As a church family, it also means we need to be financially healthy in order to step into the ministry opportunities on the horizon. There's an insider saying around here used by our finance team when we ask them about spending money, ask me in January. Like many ministries, December giving makes all the difference in how healthy we are financially as we head into the new year. We're currently only 7% behind budget as we head into December, and we're amazed at your faithfulness. With the majority of our church family still joining in weekly online and our ability to engage in ministry limited at best, your continued financial partnership has been remarkable. We also ask you to prayerfully consider your continued investment at the end of this year in order to help us have a healthy financial position headed into the new year. We look forward to the day when we've all gathered again in person, but we know for many that it's important to wait a bit longer. We want all of you to know that we love you and look forward to seeing you in person. But in the meantime, we'll continue to move forward in offering a quality online worship experience. And for those gathering on campus in person already, we'll continue to do our best to be as safe as we can be in order to continue those worship experiences. Two Rivers Church, we love you. And this past year has reminded us of just how much. And we look forward to praying with you as we begin 2021. What might God do as we all pray in the same direction? We don't know, but we're looking forward to finding out. Hey, I'm Tim. I'm the campus pastor at our Bearden campus. And just hearing Jason's words there just reminds me. Um, when he says, uh, we love you, I believe him. I know Jason well enough and I know our elders well enough to know that they do, they love us and they love this church 
And so I'm so glad that I get to be a part, that we get to be a part of Two Rivers and part of this, this body, um, even when we're um, separated face-to-face -face much of the time. Um, so thanks for continuing to faithfully be a part of our church and to join us online. Um, it's so important that we keep doing this together. And uh, so today, as we're worshiping online, just remember, um, we got folks who want to pray with you. Hunter will be with you in the chat if you have any questions or want to chime in. Um, he's available there as well. And as we head into a time of worshiping together, listening for God to speak to us together as a body, um, let's pray as we head into that. Join me. Heavenly Father, um, we're grateful for our church family um, and that as a body, you have grafted us into your family and that we're united in you, God. Those are such good things and they can just sound like words, but um, today, God, as we worship you, would you um, take them beyond words and remind us in our hearts by your spirit that we're one in you, that you are with us, and that even when we're physically apart, God, we are still um, united with one another in you, God. Strengthen us by that and encourage our hearts today for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory in peace.
Well, good weekend to you. My name is Mark, and for all y'all listening online, we're so glad you're here. We love you. We miss you. Hope this is a great week for you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It's going to be a great week. Hey, there's moments in history that are quite significant, and yet they don't point to the full story. Here's a moment in my history that's quite significant. It happened about 31, 32 years ago. I got to get that right. It was a big moment. It was a big moment for us. I had dark hair. Terry had different hair. It was a very different life for us. And yet, if you looked at that picture, that picture doesn't describe the whole story. It just tells a small, very small part of it. There's a much bigger story that expanded and has unfolded since then. Here's another story in history that took place, much bigger than my life, and, well, part of my life, but your life as well. There's a moment that happened in history that forever has changed the world, forever has changed who we are as a people, who God's called us to be, and what he's done in our life and in our world. And we've discovered over the past few weeks that this Christmas story, the story that's been unraveling for really centuries started long before that night and has taken has taken us way beyond that night as well we started in our story talking about the foundation of the world that god had a plan to be in relationship with us before the foundation of the world he made a he made a covenant back with a man named abraham that we talked about a few weeks ago he promised abraham that he'd be connected to christmas Last week, we talked about Joshua. Joshua played the only part that Joshua was supposed to play, his part to play, and his life pointed to Christmas. This week, we're going to nestle in a little bit and talk about a man named David, whose life also, a man named David who was born in a town called, might sound familiar to you, Bethlehem, and who was connected to the lineage of Jesus. And we're going to talk about him for a little bit. He was an amazing guy, and uh, and, and the things that were pointed to him, the things that were promised to him, that his, his reign would last and move all the way up to the person of Jesus, um, continues to, to undergird that point that we were talking about a few weeks ago, that God's the author of this amazing story. He's been telling the story, and as the author, he gets to say when all the plot lines unfold and, and the things that take place. And we know in Galatians chapter 4 that just at the right time, at just the right time, God sent his son Jesus into the world to redeem us. But when the fullness of time had come, another way to say that, at just the right time, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. At just the right time, God sent Jesus to redeem us all. Folks, that's the overriding and underlying and overriding story and theme of Christmas itself. That's what Christmas is all about. In fact, that's what the entire Bible is all about. All the storylines in Scripture unfold that very same plot line, that God had this insatiable desire to be in relationship with us, to be with us. That's been God's plan all along. And you know this from your own life. No relationship is worth anything that's one-sided. It was always meant to be two-sided. It was always meant to go both ways. And so as we've headed closer to this Christmas season, as we head into the, the holiday itself this week, Christmas could be an opportunity for us to, to allow this weight to rest in our lives like never before, that God is still with us asking me to pursue him. God is still with me asking me to pursue him. God is still moving toward me and asking me to respond. It's always been this way. In the Old Testament, God refers to and calls his people. He says, I will be your God if you will be my people. And so he's always longed for this relationship that went both ways. He's always been in pursuit of us and always longing for us to pursue him back. In fact, hear this. It's when we pursue him back, we experience the fullness of him still being with us. We pick up this week in 1 Samuel. We're going to look at the life of David. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, some familiar verses. I love this passage of Scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to pick it up and uh, follow along with us. The Lord said to Samuel, who was a prophet, how long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint um, for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded him and came to Bethlehem. 
The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed that's before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and he said, he made um, him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we'll not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Here, here's a little backstory um, what, what, what's taking place here. God, God tolerates sometimes our foolishness and gives us what he wants, gives us what we ask for, still in a pursuit of us. Israel longed to have a king. They wanted a king like all the other nations had a king. They didn't like having an invisible king that, that they knew was there, but no one else saw and understood and, 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 and was a part of. And so they asked God for a king. And even Samuel, who said to them, Samuel was a prophet. He goes, this isn't going to work out well for you. It's not a good intention to, to be pursuing a king. And even after um, Samuel went, at, went to God and asked them and told, told God that they were asking for a king. God says this to his people through Samuel. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they've not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. And Saul was chosen as king. Saul was the first king. God did not relinquish his kingship, and yet he worked through human structures in a constant pursuit of, after his people. In, in their own foolishness, still working through the structures to pursue his people. David was the second king of Israel, not the first. In fact, um, David was the king that all other kings were held up to and compared to, and, but not Saul. God made a promise to King David. He, he promised David that his kingdom and his kingship would last forever. It would reach all the way to the promised king, Jesus, which includes him in the Christmas story in his rightful place. The, the difference between David and Saul was a matter of the heart. And this theme emerges over and over in David's life. God is still with me and asked me to pursue him back. This pursuit is a heart attitude. David's heart set him apart from the get-go. He, he was chosen because of it. And I believe this is why God made a similar promise to David that he made to Abraham. Remember he promised Abraham, he said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. In fact, you're your lineage will go on forever. He makes the same promise to David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, he says, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This forever links David to Jesus. And as I looked at this passage and a bunch of passages and compared these two men, and I get it, We'll get to that in a little bit about David's heart, but like, what, what, was, what was uniquely different about David's heart that wasn't about Saul's heart? Because when I look at these two guys, there seems to be a, a decent amount of similarity with these guys. You know, neither of them wanted the job. You remember some of your history, right? Like Saul was hiding among the luggage and the baggage. He didn't want the job. And David, when, you know, they had all of his brothers pass by the prophet, and even his father didn't think, surely they're not going to pick David. David was out herding the sheep. Neither of them were looking for it, and yet both ended up as king. They were both decent kings. They both had some military success. They both broadened the territories. They were both used to unify the kingdom. They, they, they both had some decent leadership chops. So both of them were pretty similar. And here's another way they were similar. If you flip the coin to the dark side of their lives, they both were significantly flawed. Saul was a, was a, a painfully insecure guy. Had some narcissism going on in his world and his life. He was insecure he was paranoid. He had a raging temper. He killed a whole bunch of people, even people in his own family. 
So Saul had some things going, going on with him, but, but David, I mean, you know some of the story, right? David, David had a thing for the ladies, you know? As kings were told, hey, don't collect wives. And what David did, he collected wives and concubines, and that wasn't enough. When all good kings were supposed to be off to war and, and good leaders off to war with their people, David held back. David stayed back and had an eye on the, on the gal next door. And it was his, his intention to bed that gal, and so he did. David's wandering eye took him to places I'll bet he wish he'd never been. He took, he took Bathsheba into his, into his bed. They conceived a child, and then to, to hide that, to cover, to cover it all up, he, he murdered her husband. So when you look at their hearts, you think, well, it's a heart attitude. It seems like there's, there's, there's some similarities here. They both had some stuff they were struggling with. So why was Saul's kingdom rejected, and David, David's kingdom promised to have an eternal shelf life? Um, both were confronted by the prophets. Both were, were confronted. That's how God spoke to his people through his prophets. Both were, were called up on their disobedience to God. And yet there's this sense with Saul that he appears to have regret at times. He appears to be sorry for what he's done. But with David, it's not just regret. It's repentance. It's remorse that leads to repentance. Some of the Psalms cry out. David cries out, cleanse me with hyssop that I'll be clean. Wash me so I'll be whiter than snow. For I've sinned against you. Only you have I sinned against. So you're proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. David's heart was a heart that moved to a place of repentance. There's a difference between regret and repentance. I don't know if anyone's ever offended you and said this to you, and you have one or two choices. People can say this. They can say, hey, I'm so sorry if what I've done has offended you or hurt you in any way. It was not my intent. I'm sorry. Well, that's an apology, right? Or it can look like this. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I want to do all I can to make this thing right. Which one, which one weighs out <laughs> as, as a hard attitude that you want to emulate? It's the second. And that's what we see over and over in David's life. And here's God's response to the heart of Saul and David and their disobedience. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 through 14, Samuel said to Saul, You've done foolishly, and you've not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. And get this, see this here, for, the, for then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. It, it would have happened with Saul. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you've not kept what the Lord had commanded you. David's heart response, his pursuit of God, solidified God's presence with him. <laughs> The pursuit is demonstrated in heart behavior. David was referred to, and we've heard this phrase about him, if you know anything about David, as a man after God's own heart. He's referred to that by Samuel here in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, Paul, when he's giving a, a recounting of Israel's history, he also refers to David as a man after God's own heart. Listen to what Paul writes in Acts chapter 13. And when he'd removed him, he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart and who will do my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior. And you see the connection here? Jesus, as he promised. David promised that his kingdom would last forever, would reach forever, and it has in the person of Jesus Christ. David was a man after God's own heart. You can read this a couple different ways. At least I do. A man after God's own heart. What does that mean to be a man after God's own heart? It means probably like to have a heart like God. David had a heart like God. There, there, there were characteristics and qualities in David's life that, that he emulated. And, and it, it had the image of God in, in the way he treated people. We read a few minutes ago, David already knew at the very early stage, very early age, that he was going to be king. He was anointed as king, and the Holy Spirit came upon him and was with him from that day forward. And so David was supposed to be king, and the time had come for David to be king, and Saul wouldn't give, the, give up the grip on his kingship. He wouldn't let it go. And even after all David had done, David was, uh, he was a, a help and an aid to, to Saul. He fought for Saul. He played tunes to soothe the tormented spirit of Saul. He was Saul's son, Jonathan's best friend. He, he was very meaningful to Saul and the kingdom. And yet, Saul wanted him dead. And so Saul went after him several times to kill him. He wanted, he wanted David, and Saul did as a threat. He wanted him dead. And David had two or three opportunities to respond to Saul and to take him out and to take his rightful place on the throne that he was promised. And it, it, it had been 
told from his early days and from his early years. In fact, there's one awkward moment in a cave. You can go look it up if you want to. And David had an opportunity to take Saul out and uh, could, have, could have been over and done, taken over the kingdom. And when David was asked, why didn't you stand up against the Saul? Why didn't you take him out? Why didn't, you had your moment. Why didn't you do it? And David said, I'm not going to raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. There was a respect and a reverence that David had for people that resembled the heart of God. Later on in David's reign, he had another son. His son was Absalom. He tried to pull a coup. And David showed mercy. There's another guy. I love his name. If I, if I was ever going to have a son, easy to say now, right? I'd name him this, Mephibosheth, just because Mephibosheth. It just sounds fun to say. He had a, Jonathan's son's name was Mephibosheth, and, and he was crippled. He was uh, collateral damage when Jonathan and Saul were killed. And David took it upon his heart to take care of Mephibosheth for the rest of his days, sat him at the king's table. David was kind. All these and more are a reflection of the character and the heart of God. He was a man who had a heart after God. He he had a heart like God's. And this in part is the meaning. I think that's the first part of the meaning. But I really think the second part of the meaning, the other side of the meaning, probably fuels the first part. And the second part of this meaning is that David was a man after God's own heart means he had a heart for God. He had a heart to pursue God. Pursuing the heart of God. That was David's deal. And this pursuit of God demonstrated his heart behavior. Because he was pursuing God, he was able to emulate the character and the qualities of God. David went after God wholeheartedly. Another word for heart behavior is worship. He worshiped. He sought to worship God. I know when we, we first think and hear that word worship, we immediately go to music, and, and that's rightfully so, especially for David. David was a very musical guy. In fact, we, we know that he penned at least 73 of the Psalms, which are called songs. David wrote 73 of these and probably so many more. David was, used music to actually pursue the heart of God. Music has a way of reaching below the surface and connecting our thoughts and feelings in a place that probably nothing else does. I don't know if you can think of a song or a tune that just stirs something within you. And I, when I read the Psalms, and we don't even have the melodies anymore, I'm blown away by some of the, the, the ways in which the, the, the folks who wrote the Psalms are able to articulate something that, that goes on in my heart and my mind. I can't put words to, but when I read them on paper, it's like they come to life. I can't imagine what the, the tunes that, must have, that went with these must have sounded like. Songs have a way of doing that. They stir something within us. There's songs this time of year that bring back memories. I have this one song on a playlist that comes up when I run, and uh, it's by a band that I found a year or so ago. And I, it, I don't know if you've got a song like this, but there's some songs that just move you like no other song does. And so I'll be running, and uh, this song will come on my playlist. It's, it's by We the Kingdom. I think it's called... Um, dancing on the waters, but they get to this one line, the music swells, and, and, and I get emotional. I almost have to stop running when I hear it, and the line comes through, I dare you to believe how much I love you. And there's something about the, the swelling of the music, the deliverance of that lyric that moves my heart and my mind in a way like nothing else does. And, and, and that's, what, that's what music does. It has the opportunity and the potential to move us and give us an expression for what we often don't have. And, and David... David had an intellectual understanding of who God was. He knew who God was. And that was enmeshed with an ex experiential grasp of who God had been in his life and who he knew God to be. An expression of the mind and the heart. And though music is a rather significant expression, worship's more than a song. Worship is so much more than a song. In fact, it's any and all heart behaviors that are rooted in the belief that God is above and over all. Worship is our response to God's self-revelation. David got this. He was, a, he was a man who was known with a heart after God, not, not because he could write good tunes, but because he pursued the heart of God. And the tunes just literally flowed out of the man who was chasing heart after God. He longed to be near the presence of God. He even moved the Ark of the Covenant, which is where the presence dwelt of God, to Jerusalem in its rightful place, and also so that he'd be near it. His pursuit of God implies and reflects the fact that even as king, he saw one greater than himself. And I think that's, again, the difference between Saul and David. Even as king, he was king, and yet he bowed down and saw one as greater than himself. And folks, Christmas reminds us today to have a heart after God is about the pursuit of the right person and not perfection. 
It's about pursuit of the right person. It's about pursuit of Jesus and not perfection. We've already covered David's rap sheet. We know he had a pretty dark side to his life. To say the man struggled in a few areas of his life would be putting it lightly. And yet, we also read that as a young man, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God came upon him, rushed upon him, and was with him from that day forward. David didn't get his life straight and get all things together and and then become a man after God's own heart. David was a mess, and as he was a mess, he was a man after God's own heart. It was in the process and the pursuit of God. And I don't know about you, but if there's anything that we're talking about this weekend, that's pretty encouraging to me. That's pretty encouraging to me. I, I, I've been nestled in a psalm recently. It's, it's Psalm 107. And uh, there, it, it's probably written by David as well. And in the beginning of the psalm, it says, um, let, the, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hey, I've been redeemed at just the right time. At just the right time, God sent his son. At just the right time, he redeemed me, brought me into a relationship with him. And it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I want to say so. There are some churches, I was a part of a church for a while, and rather than saying, hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? Um, they would say this, God is good. Response to come back all the time. All the time, God is good. And I used to, I heard that and after a while, I was like, come on, that's just, that sounds almost trite after a while. And yet, I was reading this psalm, and I was like, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let them say so. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. And when I look at my life and look at God and what he's done uh, in and through my life, um, his love and his steadfast love has endured forever. And then down in verse 17 and 22 of the same psalm, Psalm 107, it's a part of this portion of scripture where the pursuit of God, not the perfection of following God, draws me in and includes me and includes you. Here's what he says. And he's talking to several people. He, he lists several folks through, through, throughout Psalm 107 who, who were following God but lost their way and, and came back. And here in 17, he says this. Some were fools in their sinful ways and because of their iniquity suffered affliction. Anybody been a fool in their sinful ways and because of your iniquity suffered affliction? I'll raise my hand if I didn't have it holding the Bible right now. They loathed any kind of food. They drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deed in songs of joy. <laughs> Folks, this isn't about perfection, but it's about the pursuit. David penned these words in his pursuit of God. God is still with me, asking me to pursue him. You might be here this weekend saying, I'm not feeling it. I've heard it. I have saw it. I, I, I appreciate your bumper video. God is still with me. I hear you saying it. I, I'm not feeling it. I'm going to challenge you a little bit. You might not be feeling it because you might not be pursuing God. I really do believe that, that our experiencing God being with us is, is, is found and experienced in us pursuing him back. He's pursued us. He's calling us to pursue him back. The stuff that's gotten in your way, Maybe the long list of stuff, your rap sheet you think about, well, I've confessed it and I prayed about it, but I just don't feel like I'll ever get close to God because of these things. That's you. That's not God. The stuff that has you and I weary after a long, daggum a long year and feeling, allowing me to feel like, I, I don't know, is God still with me? That's not, that's not God. That's me. God is still with me, inviting me, asking me, impelling me, compelling me to pursue, to pursue him back. There's no better time than Christmas. No better time for us to remind ourselves of this. Christmas is the opportunity to pursue the right person. It's the opportunity for us to pursue, to pursue the right person, for us to pursue Jesus. Familiar Christmas passages, Luke chapter 1, the angel appears to Mary, who was betrothed to Joseph, who was from the house of David. And the angel said to her in verse 30, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. You hear that promise? And he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom, there'll be no end. King Jesus, the same Jesus that the wise men saw it. And we see that in Matthew chapter 2. They, they left their stargazing, followed one star, and they came to Jerusalem. 
pretty close to Bethlehem, and said, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him in pursuit of Jesus, an opportunity for us to pursue the right person. Christmas offers us an opportunity to pursue Jesus. The, the event was marked by God's pursuit, Emmanuel, God with us. And I don't know where any of your hearts are here or in living rooms across Knoxville, but if you've never given your heart to Jesus, if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never responded to God being with you, this is your time. This is your perfect opportunity to say, I'm in. I want to say yes to Jesus. And for the rest of us, all of us who've already said yes to Jesus, Christmas marks that moment where Jesus entered our world and, and, and it was solidified at just the right time when you and I said yes to Jesus. We, we actually entered into that presence with Christ that we'll have for all of eternity. And here's the deal. God is still with us. And as God is still with us, he's calling all of us to more. He's calling me to more. He's calling you to more. In response to the extreme measures that God has gone to so that we would be in relationship with him, that he'd be with us. How can our response be anything less than David's in pursuing him right back? Meaningful relationships are all about the pursuit of knowing the other person more. They're all about the pursuit of knowing the other person more. I talk about my dad a lot. Um, I don't have any other stories, I guess, but I talk about my dad a lot, and I'm going to tell you why tonight. Um, I didn't really know my dad 20, 25 years ago. I knew a lot about him. I knew a lot about the man. I mean, there was a moment in, in time when, when our relationship was solidified. It was a Thursday. It was also payday. It was 11.55 a.m. on September 22nd, 1960. And this little bugger entered the world, and I began a relationship with him. It was a moment that marked that relationship for all of eternity. I'll know my dad forever. And I know a lot about my dad. I grew up in a house, and I'm pretty observant. I knew he loved my mom. I told you some stories about that before. Well, I knew he... He adored her and uh, flat out in love with her. In fact, if he had to choose us or her, he'd pick her in a heartbeat every time. He must have loved her because I remember this one, I was sitting thinking about that this week, and I, I remember my mom and dad coming out from the, the back bedroom and down the hallway when I was a kid, and I thought they were dressed for Halloween. Um, it was January. It was weird. And my mom had this big skirt that went out like two feet from her body with all this fluff under it, I don't know what you call it, but... And my dad came out smiling, and he had this crisp shirt on and this really funky-looking bow tie. And we said, Dad, what, what's up? And he goes, your mom and I have signed up for square dancing. And uh, he, he sold it like it was his idea. We, we, we didn't live in South Carolina. We live in South Jersey. So it was, just, it, it, it was a step off the norm. Like, I, I, I didn't know anybody. I thought Hee Haw was a TV show. I didn't think it happened in your living room, right? The man loved her. I knew that. My dad loved God. He loved the church. I remember um, my dad serving on missions, missions meetings and mission committees. And in fact, it felt like they met in our house a lot, but it felt like every other Friday night there was a mission meeting at our house. And my dad was sitting there and having 10 or 15 people a part of this meeting. And he was usually the brawn behind anything that took place, whether it was a conference at the church or in a project we were after. And my dad loved the local church. I remember my dad I think I've told some of you that been through Wade in before. My dad sat me down the first time I got, had a paper route and put all my money there, and he said, hey, 10% of that goes to God. Just like I do, you're going to do it too, boy. And that's how it rolled. My dad loved the local church, loved God. He was a quiet man. He didn't say a whole lot, at least not to me. The stuff I heard from my dad was often, most often, rebuke and correction. Maybe I needed it. I thought, you know, I was the last of five boys I thought he was pretty strict. He might have just been surviving. I don't know. Um, but I knew a lot about my dad. And yet, and let me give you one more thing. Just some random memories from, from my childhood. I remember him rubbing my little skinny check with, chest with Vicks vapor rub when I was sick and then swiping my nose with it. I remember him picking me up at a store in Ocean City, New Jersey when I got busted for shoplifting as a teenager and drove me home. And in grad school, somehow I was uninsured and I had an emergency gallbladder surgery that he didn't have the money for, but somehow he stepped up and paid for it. I know a lot about my dad. And 20, 25 years ago, I realized, I don't know that I know him. I know a lot about him. And I came to a, a, a conclusion, like, well, I think that's on me. It, it's up to me to know him. And so I, I, made, a, I made a choice. 
I made a decision. I'm going to pursue this guy. I, I want to know who he is. I want to know what makes him tick. I want, to know, I want to know the backstory. I want to know really who this guy is. And I was living in a different state at the time, and so I just decided, uh, fell into this pattern where I, I would go quarterly to see my dad. I can, fly in, I can fly out on a Friday morning, get to Philadelphia, rent a car, get to, um, get to a place, get, get to his place, pick him up, take him out for either a steak or a corned beef on rye with coleslaw and Russian dressing. You want to get hungry? Take a picture of this. There's my dad, corned beef on rye with coleslaw and Russian dressing. You never had one, you need to have one of those. And over those meals, you can leave that picture up for a moment or two. And at those meals, I got to know my dad. I got to ask him questions about his life, about his heart, about his walk with God, about his relationship with my mom and our family that I don't know if I would have ever discovered had I not decided to do that. I remember one particular time I went to uh, see him in New Jersey and we went down and sat on the beach for a little while and it must have been God that gave me this thought to ask him this because this isn't something that's indicative of the way we Hoffman boys related. But we're sitting on the beach and we're both looking out the ocean. I said, hey, dad, tell me something I wouldn't have the nerve to ask you. And we just sat there for a while and I thought, oh, I've blown it now. It was a great moment and it was quiet. For, it felt like forever. And then my dad started to talk. And he talked and talked. It was the longest conversation I've ever had with my dad. It, it went some two plus hours. With little pauses between each thought, moving on to something else. There were things he told me about him and what he thought and felt that, that had us holding our gut with laughter. Like, it, it hurt to laugh that hard. And there were other things that he shared with me that day um, that only tears and silence were the proper response. My dad turns 97 next week, survived COVID last week. <laughs> Turns 97 last week and still a stud. Still, I say this all the time, so I'll say this at his funeral. I'll put it on his gravestone if I have to. He's still at 97 teaching his boys how to be men. And here's the deal. Don't walk away with a kind story about a, a man and his father. Get the significance. If I would not have pursued my dad back, I would have missed the depth of this man. I would have missed the depth of the relationship that I have with him. And that's the call. God is still with me and asking me to pursue him. God is still with you, asking you to pursue him back. I, I hope and pray that next year's different, next year's better. It may be, it may not be. Nobody's promising anything, right? But, but here's the deal. I hope that when we get to the end of next year, each and every one of us here and online have a deeper grasp of who God is. He's done it all. Emmanuel, God with us. He's come to be with us. And he's asking us to pursue him back. And it starts today. It starts with, with moving just a little further into your relationship with God. Let me give you just, I know it's a busy week. I know some of you, are, you got lists you're already getting after for the rest of the week. But I'm going to ask you between now and Wednesday, Wednesday night, set aside 10, 15 minutes. And I'm going to invite you to, to join me in Psalm 107. Pick up Psalm 107 and ask God this question. I promise you, I promise you he'll answer you. God, what is it you want me to know about you? As I read through this, I know that the Holy Spirit wants you to know more about who God is. The Holy Spirit will speak to you this week. Just spend a few moments and ask God, what is it you want me to know about you? Let me ask you to do one more thing. You've heard us talk about it. No one's getting... Um, applause for a campaign, a successful campaign. We're, we're doing 21 days of prayer here at the church. Um, and as you've heard, there, there, is no, there, there is no real agenda, but there is one. Here's the agenda. We want you to fall more deeply in love with Jesus than you've ever, than you've ever been before. That's what we want for ourselves. We want, that's what we want for our church. I don't know what 2021 is going to bring. I know 2020 found me kind of hitting the bottom of the well and pulling up sludge. I, I don't want to get to sludge again. I want to be in a place where I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing for something deeper and there's something deeper there. And that, that is the person in the life of Jesus in me. That's what we long for, for us as a people, for you individually and for us as a church. No one's going no to make you do it. We're, we don't, we're not keeping a list of the people who've taken books and we're not, we're not, we're not doing that. But, but what a joy for us to be able to do this individually and, and corporately and collectively. I thought about this when I was running the other day. You know, running alone, it, it can be fun. But if you're, if you're actually running and doing something, like if you're going to train for a half marathon or something, and it, it's your race. Nobody can make you do it. Nobody can actually put your foot in front of the next. No, nobody can run the race for you. 
you got to run your own race, but it, it's great to have someone breathing right next to you, isn't it? That's what we want to do in the month of January. For 21 days, we want, to, we want to dig deeper. We want to pursue Jesus like we've never done before. I'm asking you to do that with us. You in? I hear you. I hear you online. We're in. We're going to do this thing. Let's seek Jesus like we've never done before. Let me, let me close our time together. Would you stand? Let me pray for us. Father God, we just thank you so much for your pursuit of us. For at just the right time, you sent Jesus and rescued us. And we are the redeemed, and we say so. We say, you are a good God. Your steadfast love has certainly endured forever. God, may we be a people more than ever before who are in just deep pursuit of knowing more of who you are and giving ourselves more and more to the person of Christ. Hear our heart's desire. It's in his name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. of sin is broken There's a reason why the darkness runs for light There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven Jesus is alive There's a reason why we are not overtaken There's a reason why we sing on through the night There's a reason why our hope remains eternal Jesus is alive Praise the King He is risen Praise the King
God is here. He's with us. He's still with us. He's still with you. And if that's the case, if God is here, if he's present, like Mark said, how can our response be any less than David's? Um, to pursue him uh, because he's near, because he's here. And so I look forward to the new year as a church and the opportunities we're going to have to pursue him. And it's my hope that even today, you won't wait till January 1st uh, for those 21 days, but even today you'll begin saying, God, how, how do you want me to pursue you today as we go after him to really know him together? Have a great week.